Uh, cool. So uh, I have a couple of things written down here just uh, because it's, I'm going to mention them multiple times in the talk, and I think it's easier if we have, have them there. Um, so today I'm going to talk about clustering, but before I start, I wanted to thank my amazing collaborators, Damien and Cornell and Kai Sheng at Columbia. So I'm going to talk about clustering, and I'm guessing most of you already know what clustering is. Clustering is a process in which we're giving an unlabeled data set that we believe can be classified into similar groups, and our task is to give them labels according to the groups. So this is sort of a very generic task in machine learning that appears all over the place, uh, from computer vision to linguistics to genomics, and we have a ton of algorithms to solve clustering problems. Uh, and it's kind of hard to capture all the distributions that appear in the wild, but we would like to have guarantees for the algorithms that we have, at least for simple and nicely behaved distributions. And so the talk today is about a very simple distribution, a very simple model that makes many of the state-of-the-art algorithms struggle a lot. So what's the model? The model is simply gonna be a Gaussian mixture where with probability half, I'm gonna sample from a Gaussian with minus mu mean and covariance sigma. And with probability a half, I'm just gonna change the sign of my mean. So I'm gonna have the same covariance. The picture that you should have in your head is you have two bells, one center at minus mu, one center at mean. Cool. Just to, think, to make things a little bit more explicit, I'm going to write the latent variables yi's for the signs. So these are going to be one and minus one with probability of half. This is just going to be multiplying the mean, and then I'm going to add a center uh, Gaussian with the right covariance. Cool. So our goal is to give a sample, so just the x's. We want to recover these labels, the y's. Okay. Very simple. You're probably thinking. Just a very good question. Maybe you'll answer later, but. Is this model equivalent, and if yes, in what sense, to the case where both mu's are known but not necessarily? Ah, okay, I get it. Stupid question. Yeah, never mind. So it's the same as saying you have two unknown vectors mu. Yeah, you can recenter it. It's just yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Okay. So, but you are probably thinking there are there are many algorithms to solve this. There's k-mean. There's PCA. There are many ways to do this. Why is this actually important? Well, we are going to impose ourselves a couple of challenges. The first challenge is that we want our mixtures to be stretch, meaning that usually in, in most papers, people think of the, the clusters as being spherical. So you have spherical clusters that are well separated, and there is clearly a direction of separation. Uh, but here we're going to stretch those clusters. So we're going to have sort of two parallel pancakes, and there is separation, but now they're very stretched. And so you might think, Many of these de facto solutions, such as PCA, would struggle here because of the following reason. Like PCA is looking for the direction of maximum variance. What's the direction of maximum variance in this case? Well, it would be this direction, which actually gives me a good classifier. But if I stretch things, I might change that direction and make it, make it completely orthogonal to the thing I actually want to learn, right? OK, so that's our first challenge. Our second challenge is going to be efficiency. So we want to be as efficient as possible, both in terms of computational and statistical resources. And I'm going to come back to exactly what I mean by computational and statistical resources in just a bit. But before I talk about efficiency, I need to talk about what's an easy problem. So how do we measure how much signal do we have when compared to the noise that we have? So let's start with a very easy, easy case. So let's start in one dimension. In one dimension, what we really want to measure is how much separation do I have between the means when compared with the variance. If I don't have that much separation and I have a lot of variance, then I'm going to have a lot of overlap and it's going to be hard to classify this problem. I'm not going to see a lot of signal. On the other hand, if I have a lot of separation and very little variance, then it's going to be easy to classify the problem. And so a natural signal to noise ratio metric would be the mean squared over the, the variance. Very simple. Now let's try to generalize, to generalize to higher dimensions. Well, in that case, there is variance in many different directions. But we really just care about the direction in which we have separation. So here we have parallel pancakes. So we know that there is such direction. And so I would like to have something like this in that particular direction. And there is a very easy formula for that if you think about it for a little bit. And this is just this quadratic form, uh, mu transpose the inverse of the covariance times mu. So that's just this SNR that I wrote, that from, wrote down right there. Okay. 
Cool. So now we know what's an easy problem and what's a hard problem. If this is large, it should be easy. If it's small, it should be hard. So now, how do we measure efficiency? We have a couple, we need to define a couple of metrics. One is going to be the misclassification error. The misclassification error is how many labels am I getting wrong? And the other one is going to be the sample complexity. So how many samples do I need to learn a good classifier in terms of this misclassification error? Let's be a little bit more explicit. So if I have the true labels and I have an estimator of those true labels, the misclassification error is simply, let's count how many errors am I making? Since I might be wrong up to a sign, I'm gonna account for that with that mean, and I want everything to be normalized. So I'm gonna divide by the number of samples I have. Very simple. So what does it mean to be efficient in that case? Well, we can consider the best possible estimator that we can get. That would be the base optimal estimator. That's simply the thing that minimizes this guy. Turns out that the thing that minimizes that guy achieves the following error. It's a, an exponential of minus the SNR, the SNR that we just defined. So this SNR is truly capturing the difficulty of this problem in, ter in terms of this misclassification error. Now, this optimal base uh, estimator is actually very simple. I told you there is one direction which we can classify. And it's just the estimator that looks into that direction and asks, are you asks, well, are you on one side of the hyperplane or the other? Very simple. Cool. Now, for the sample complexity, now we're going to define this as the minimum number of samples necessary to achieve this base optimal error. And what's a good baseline for that? Well, we can consider a simpler problem. The problem where we are not only, not only given the data points, but also the samples. And we don't want to learn the samples. We want to learn a good classifier. In order to get a classifier that achieves something like this, the sample complexity that you need is at least a, a constant times the dimension. So the best sample complexity that we could hope for should be linear in the damage. Cool. But if we see both baselines, we see that we either need the labels or we need uh, the covariance and the mean. So this leads to a very natural question. Actually, two very natural questions. One is going to be statistical and the other one is going to be computational. The statistical question is, if I don't know anything, I don't know the labels, I don't know the mean, I don't know the covariance, can I still get the optimal rate with <coughs> near linear sample complexity? And the computational one is natural, is if that's possible, can I get a tractable algorithm that would compute that? I'm going to spoil the rest of the talk for you right now. So the answer to this question is yes, there is a way to do it with some optimization problem over the hypercube. The answer to the second question is a little bit more subtle. It doesn't really seem possible unless you're given more samples. And I'm going to get back to this point by what I mean by it doesn't seem possible. Um, but these are the two questions that we want to ask. Since you're spoiling the end of the talk, I'm going to spoil my answer my question to the end of the talk, probably. The question is, uh, here you do not um, take into account the probability, right? The probability, the confidence bound, basically. The confidence bound. What do you yes. mean? I mean, so if we look at the ah, oh, okay, I see. you do you do have it to talk because this is the the error of the bias of simplifier. Yes. Okay. Uh, then probably I will ask it later. Okay, so. sounds good. Uh, so, but before I jump into answer these questions, I wanted to quickly review the previous work and why the previous work is actually not answering these questions. And so, broadly speaking. There are two lines of work, one that assumes that you know the covariance and one that doesn't assume that you know the covariance. If, we assume that, if you assume that you know the covariance, then the problem becomes actually simple because you can multiply by the square root of the inverse of the covariance, all of your data points, and that actually changes the distribution in such a way that your covariance is now an identity, meaning that you really have spherical covariance, uh, spherical clusters just as before, and there are many algorithms that can solve for problems like this. And uh, there is a very, very long list of, of uh, ideas here using PCA, using k-means, using semi-definite relaxations, using all sorts of very beautiful ideas. And the general message from all of these papers is that really you can achieve the best error that you can have with linear sample complexity. So exactly what we needed and what we wanted, but assuming that you know the covariance. Natural question is, can we estimate a covariance? This is a much harder problem because uh, we're estimating a matrix before we just had a vector. But we could try to do this. And something natural is just let's take 
the, the covariance of the mixture, not necessarily the components. But if you take the covariance of the mixture and you try to estimate it, you would find that it's sort of a mixture of the thing that you want plus a rank one matrix. And it's really hard to decouple those two unless you're given more information. And um, all the existing works that try to do this and that I know of actually require way higher sample complexity. Um, it might be the case that you can do it, but I, I don't know of a good way to do it. And this is a no-go for us because we want to be optimal in terms of statistics. Cool. And now there is this other line of work that assumes that you don't know the covariance. One line of work is happy having, happy having higher sample complexity. Again, uh, sorry. And there is another line of work that uses sort of a different kind of signal to noise ratio. So the higher sample complexity part um, usually has a, a sample complexity that is some polynomial. These are also very beautiful ideas that might tackle even harder cases than the one that we're considering here, but they're happy having polynomials. Sometimes the polynomial is d to the hundred. Uh, in any case, it's always higher than uh, square. So it's an, again, a no-go for us. And there are other algorithms that consider a slightly different kind of signal to noise ratio. So before I told you, there are many different directions in which I can have variance. And I wanna measure the variance in a very specific direction, but you can also measure the variance in the worst possible direction. So you could try to generalize the baby steps that we talked about, but taking the worst possible direction instead. And that would be this, this quantity. And what people can prove with this quantity is actually almost what we want, that you obtain an error that decreases as mi minus the exponential, sorry, exponential of minus this S with linear sample complexity. But the issue is that, sorry, uh, and there are many papers doing this, but the true issue is that this S is very, very different from our S and R. So let's, let's see quickly why. Imagine that you have uh, spherical clusters. And if you look at the worst possible uh, variance direction, that would be any direction. And so whenever this is big, it really means that your, your uh, spheres are separated. But if you stretch them, then the worst possible covariance is actually really high when compared to the separation. And so you can easily prove with very simple examples that you can have very small signal to noise ratio with this S and very high signal to noise ratio with RS. Yes. I guess another way to say that is this, this measure is not the final variant, whereas the previous measure is. Yes. And so by doing arbitrary basis changes, you may essentially a guarantee on this measure does That's, not give any yes. guarantee on that measure. Yes. That's, uh, we're going to get back to that in like three slides. <laughs> uh, so in general, this is the case that whenever this is high, the SNR is going to be high, but not the other way. Cool. So just to summarize all the previous work, either assume, works, assume that you know the covariance, uh, have higher sample complexity, or have a suboptimal dependency on the right signal to noise ratio. So you might be thinking this is just a byproduct of their analysis, maybe their algorithms work, but when you try to run them in practice, actually they struggle a lot. So let me give you an example. Here we did an experiment with fashion MNIST. If you're Familiar with MNIST, those are small pictures of handwritten numbers. Uh, fashion MNIST are just small pictures of clothes. So we subsample a, uh, a thousand data points of uh, two classes in fashion MNIST, t-shirts and pullovers, and we classify them using k-means in one of the new algorithms that I'm gonna propose. And so if you project all the data points into two dimensions, the thing that you obtain is really something that looks like two stretch clusters. If you classify using k-means, your classification gives you something that looks orthogonal to the true classifier. And this is what you get with one of the algorithms that we're gonna cover in this talk. If you measure the misclassification error, the misclassification error for these guys are 44.7%, uh, or misclassification error is 7.1%. Because of the sign issue, the worst possible misclassification error that you can get is 50%, so this is actually fairly high. Um, Yes. This is you do PCA and take the, the two components, the top, the top two components. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So now we're ready for the agenda. So we already did the introduction. Next, we're going to talk about this combinatorial problem to, that gives 
a very good estimator, then we're gonna try to give an efficient algorithm to solve this max cut problem. And finally, we're gonna talk about this idea of a, uh, a statistical to computational gap. I'll get back to exactly what I mean by that. All right, so just getting back to what you just said, the key insight is that uh, the SNR that we just defined is actually envir invariant on the any, any linear transformation that is invertible. So if I take a T that is invertible and I apply that T to the data, so I make it, I make the data uh, a sphere, a spherical, or I rotate it, or I stretch it, or I do whatever you want, provided that it's linear and invertible, then the, the SNR actually doesn't change. So the, the true insight here is that if you want a method that uh, only depends on that SNR, your method also has to be invariant under this linear transformation. And so just as a thought experiment, I'm gonna give you a canonical form of how you should think about the data. We cannot transform the data to this canonical form because it involves a transformation that we don't have access to, but we can use it just for uh, a thought experiment. So there exists a map such that if I put all my data points in a matrix and I transform it as the rows of the matrix, then what I'm gonna get distributionally is that the first component actually pretty much has the labels that I want to recover plus a little bit of noise and all the other components all the other columns are going to be pure noise so the little bit of noise that I'm adding here is uh, depends on the SNR as one over the square root of the SNR so although we cannot find this transformation we know that it exists and since the estimator that we're going to have is invariant under such <laughs> transformations we can think of the data as having in the first component the label that we want to recover and all the other components pure noise okay and if you're a statistician the first thing that you want to do when you whenever you have a problem is do maximum likelihood estimator and see what you get uh, by pure magic we obtain something that is uh, invariant under this transformation so this is actually good for us so let me give you a description of what this is uh, so here i actually wrote the canonical form that I told you about. So if I take my data and I form a matrix that looks like this, and I take the, the matrix that projects onto the subspace generated by this matrix, the range of this matrix, this is uh, that range lives in an n dimensional space and it's a subspace of dimension D. So it's just a projection onto that subspace of dimension D. That's going to be my H. Then I can actually write the MLE in the following form. I'm gonna maximize this quadratic form with my projection uh, by restricting y to be in the hypercube of ones and minus ones, okay? So very simple clean form. And maybe you've seen this before and this is the reason why we call it max cut. The max cut problem is a problem over a graph where your task is to pick two sets of the graph, the black ones and the white ones in such a way that the edges coming across the two different sets is maximized. Turns out that you can write a problem like this, exactly like this, where this H is replaced by the Laplacian of the graph, okay? But this is not the intuition that we're gonna follow. We're gonna follow a very sort of metric intuition. So before um, I told you that this H was a projection onto some soft space, and you can reinterpret this problem as minimizing the distance between the hypercube and that subspace, because this is just the distance to each one of the points in the hypercube. So I'm trying to find the thing that is the closest in the hypercube to the subspace. This is because H is a projector, so H squared equals H. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Um, just not because of Y, that's what I'm asking. Well, why has it's because if you expand this thing, you get a quadratic, you get uh, something that depends on this norm and uh, this norm, yeah, right? And the, the, the norms are actually constant, so it doesn't matter. That's my question. Do we use here that the norm of y is constant? Yes, yes, yes. You, you use the norm, yes, you use the fact that the norm is constant and that the two terms that you get in there are actually the same thing. Um, okay. So, but I said before that I can see the generators of this subspace as one of those matrices 
one of those vectors is actually pretty much the labels that I have that I want, but a little bit corrupted. And all the other things that generate that subspace are completely random. So hopefully the only thing that is really close to the subspace, given that everything else is random, is, is this vector. So by minimizing this distance, we're going to find the vector that we want to recover. That intuition is actually correct. We prove uh, that, that this solving that method actually gives you something optimal in the following sense. And I'm going to give you a result that seems very much asymptotic, but it's you can easily write a non-asymptotic version of it with the proof we have. It's just easier to present this way. So let's assume that the dimension goes to infinity. And we're going to assume that the signal to noise ratio also goes to infinity. If you don't assume that, then there's going to be a lot of overlap and there is no hope in recovering anything. Uh, and we're going to assume that the number of data points grows pretty much linearly with the dimensions, just slightly faster than that, actually. Then the following is going to happen. I'm going to have a bound with respect to the expected error of the misclassification rate. I'm going to have a bound on the probability of that error being exactly zero. Okay. And I'm going to impose two conditions. And those, the reason why I have those condi two conditions is going to be apparent in just a little bit. But the first condition is if the SNR doesn't grow that fast, so it grows pretty much like log of n, then we have that the expected error is an exponential of minus the SNR over 2 plus something that goes to 0 as the dimension increases. Now, if my SNR is actually slightly bigger than logarithmic, then not only the expectation is small, but also the probability of this error being zero is really, really high, goes to one. So there are a couple of remarks to make here. The first one is that this error here is actually the base optimal misclassification error up to this little old term. The second one, just wondering, SNR over two, is it because SNR kind of counts the mean one once, but you kind of have two means of separation? Like no. is there? Okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's because of this, this, this point here. Uh, like log of n is twice log of n is log of n squared. So is this a coincidence? So this is really because the maximum of n Gaussian random variables is uh, bounded by two log of n. Okay with hyperbole. So this is not arbitrary. It turns out that whenever the SNR is slightly bigger than two times log of n, then with high probability, there is no overlap between the two clusters. And there is a hyperplane that would divide the two. Okay. That happens even only if the SNR is larger than two log n. So, so this second part of the remark about SNR being larger than two log n, is it uh, specific to the case of a non-covariance or? Uh, uh, what do you mean specific? So, this SNR, this happens, this is independent of, uh, well, of the method, right? This is whenever you have a mixture of Gaussians that have the same covariance, then if this SNR is greater than two log n, then with high probability, there is a separating hyperplane between for the two clusters. Okay, so all right. I think I can confuse. I was thinking about what uh, uh, is statistically possible to separate them in the case when the covariance is unknown. Oh, uh, so so this is saying that in this regime, it's statistically possible to separate them. Right, but, but there should be some uh, threshold. But on one side of the threshold, it is not possible. With the other, it is possible. So, yes, the threshold is this n being large enough. And then this is it different for the case of non covariance and non covariance? Yes. yes. When you know the covariance, then you can make them spherical, in which case, uh, actually, this is, a, this is actually the same thing, but I'll, I'll get back exactly to what, what the difference is. It just okay. a couple of slides. Okay, but so this is actually telling us that whenever there is separation, max cut would get that separation and with high probability would find you something that gives you good separation. Exactly, zero separation. Zero error, sorry. The only inconvenience about this is that really solving this max cut, the best algorithms I know, take exponential time. 
And maybe some of you have heard of relaxations of max squared problems. So you might be thinking, why is this really a hard card problem? Why is this hard? So something natural that you might do is, okay, the problem that I had there is almost like an eigenvalue computation, but instead of the sphere, I have the hypercube. So I can actually try to take the sphere and see what happens. Turns out that this is a projection matrix. So the maximum eigenvalue vector is not unique. So we are not gonna get too much information out of this. Something more powerful is a semi-definite relaxation. So you might be familiar with this idea of Cummins and Williamson that uses this SDP relaxation to find uh, the max code value. Turns out that the guarantees for this actually use strongly that H is a Laplacian of a graph. We don't, we don't have a Laplacian is something else. So it's, uh, we cannot apply the guarantees. Nevertheless, we could try to apply this and I'm, I'm gonna get back to trying to apply this in, in a couple of slides. Okay, so now we wanna come up with maybe an efficient algorithm to try to solve this, something that wouldn't take exponential time. And I'm going to do something that people in optimization have been, have been doing for a couple of years now, a couple of decades, and it's tried to split the problem into the, the algorithm into two different stages. So we have a non convex problem, a problem that looks like this, minimizing this distance. Uh, the non convexity comes from the set and not from the function. And something natural that people do these days is they have two stages. The first one is an initialization stage that finds a point close to the thing that I want to that I want to have, but not exactly the point. And then they refine that solution using some iterative algorithms such as gradient descent. So I'm going to talk about those two for this particular problem. So I'm going to start with the local refinement just because it's slightly easier to understand. Um, so I said before that these really look like an eigenvalue computation. And if you want to get the top eigenvalue of a matrix, natural thing to do is it uh, power iteration, you multiply by the matrix, you project into the sphere, you multiply by the matrix, project into the sphere, and you just repeat that. We could try to do the same, but instead of projecting into the sphere, we project into the hypercube. And so that would be this very simple algorithm. We multiply by the matrix, and when, then we project onto the hypercube by taking the sign. And this, you probably already realize, is just alternating projections because this H is really projecting onto the subspace, and then we are projecting back onto the hypercube. It was proposed by von Neumann uh, almost 80 years ago. It's, it works well for a bunch of different applications. Hopefully it's gonna work well for us. All right. But in order to use this, we really needed to get a good solution that would be close enough to the thing we wanna recover. And so for that, we're gonna use a spectral algorithm. And this is slightly more convoluted and I, I don't expect you to get all the details, but let's go very quickly through the different steps of the algorithm. Just to say you project on the hypercube and not on the vertices of the hypercube. No, no, you do project onto the vertices, you, you take. Then what guarantees we have because this set is not convex? We prove guarantees. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, the different state, so that's the reason why we need something like this. We need to be close enough because otherwise we might diverge. So the different steps that we need for the spectral algorithm are, are conceptually very simple. The first step is you take your data and you multiply it by the empirical covariance matrix or the inverse of that. So you sort of change the basis of, of your data and you obtain new data points. Then you compute a weighted covariance matrix. So the covariance matrix only would have these terms. You multiply it by something else. It's not really important exactly what that is. And then you take the eigenvector associated with the minimum, with the smallest eigenvalue of this matrix, and you use that for classification. So that's going to be your linear classifier. The details are not super important. The, the intuition is simply that after you have enough data points, then this matrix is going to concentrate around a matrix that looks like an identity minus uh, rank one matrix and that rank one matrix actually gives you a very good classifier for the data that you have there. Again, the details are not super important, but the thing is that we, whenever we find the, the smallest eigenvalue, eigenvector of this guy, we're really finding an approximation of the thing that we want to recover. But the catch here is that we needed N to be much larger than uh, linear. It has to be quadratic on the dimension for this concentration to happen. So combining those two, what we get is a global convergence result. So 
Imagine that Y is the output of first running the spectral method and using that to warm start the alternating projections algorithm. Then in a slightly different regime, so if we assume now that the SNR goes to infinity as before, but N now grows quadratically with D, then the solution Y hat would actually solve the max plot problem. So we get this exactly the same guarantees as before, but with quadratic sample. But this method actually runs in polynomial time. All right, so for a long time during the pandemic, we were thinking there must be a method. Really, we, we're just silly and we, we haven't found the right method that would have the correct, the correct uh, sample complexity. But we think that uh, actually there is no method. And this is an instance where there is a separation between what you can do statistically and what you can do computationally. So what do I mean by this? What is the statistical to computational gap? So far, we've seen that whenever the SNR is large, maybe this S is small, meaning that you have something that is really, really stretched, then the landscape of what you can do looks like this. Whenever the number of samples is smaller than D, even the supervised case where you're given labels is hard to solve. This is just estimation here is impossible. But after you have enough samples, then it's statistically possible to solve the problem. Meaning that if you were giving the age of the universe to solve this problem, your data would have the information there. You could extract the information. But if you wanted to extract the information fast in a polynomial amount of time, that would actually require more samples. So we conjecture that within this orange, orange region, no matter what polynomial, no matter what polynomial time algorithm you get, the output would always perform pretty much as a random guess. It would not be correlated with the thing that you want to recover at all. And this to me is sort of related to the question you were, you were asking. This presents sort of a very clear separation between the spherical case and the stretch case. Although it's statistically possible, we open this gap as soon as we stretch things. Because before there was no gap. This line here was actually here. Cool. But this is a very strong statement, a strong conjecture. People have been trying to understand when can we prove things like this uh, from a sort of computational complexity viewpoint. And, but now it's not only computational because it's also statistical because we are not talking about worst case scenario, we're talking about the average case scenario. Nonetheless, people have been developing different, different ways to try to support these conjectures. And so here I'm gonna collect three pieces of evidence that sort of support this conjecture. Um, the first one is just numerical evidence. We're gonna run a bunch of algorithms to see what happens. The second one is gonna be a reduction. So if you're familiar with classical complexity theory, you reduce to a, from a problem that you believe to be hard and you somehow relate it to. We're gonna use a similar idea uh, for, for a hypothesis <laughs> testing problem that is believed to be hard exactly in the regime that we care about. And finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about these semi-definite relaxations. There is a very popular uh, hierarchy of semi-definite relaxations called sums of squares. We're gonna prove that those relaxations actually also fail to solve a problem. Um, although not in the case where D is squared, but when D is at three to the, uh, D to the power of three over two. So it's slightly weaker than what we really want. But this is for the max formulations specific, like for the max cut in family of instances that you have. Yes. Like where the matrix is a projection matrix. Right, right. Okay. So let me start with the numerical evidence. So what we, what we did here was we took a bunch of different parameters of D and N, and for each configuration of D and N, we drew a bunch of different problems and tried to recover and saw how many of them we could recover. So we always set the SNR to be three log N, meaning that there is separation. We can achieve perfect, uh, perfect error. So here I have the max code formulation trying to solve a bunch of different problems. In the Y axis, I have log of N, in the x-axis, I have log of D. Each pixel is, uh, we ran 10 different simulations and saw how many of them we could recover. If you see white, that means that we recovered all of them. If you see black, that means that we didn't recover any of them. And we can see very clearly that there is a sharp 
phase transition between the regime in which we cannot recover and the regime in which we can recover. And that phase transition happens at, at slope one, meaning that the complexity is linear as the theorem is saying. So now if we try to do the same thing, but now with a semi-definite relaxation that when I, I mentioned about uh, Gomez Williamson, then we also see a very sharp phase transition, but here the slope is two. And since I have a log log plot, this really means that I have quadratic sample complexity. Okay. And we repeated this experiment with a bunch of different algorithms. So the one that we gave guarantees for, the EM algorithm, and a couple of other algorithms, and they all look like this. Phase transition at slope two. Okay, so it seems like for all these famous algorithms, at least, uh, we cannot get anything better. Cool. Now, let me pass to sort of more theoretical evidence. So if you're familiar again with NP hardness, what you do with NP hardness is you have a problem that you believe is hard. You have a problem that you want to prove is hard. And you make a reduction from the one you believe is hard to the one that you want to prove is hard in such a way that if you were able to solve this problem, that would give you a solution to the other problem. Now we can do the same thing, but now not only we have the problem, but we also have a distribution and we want problem, we want results on average for every possible uh, sample from this distribution. And so we have to reduce also some kind of distribution. And the natural thing to do here is, is use a testing problem. So if you remember from statistics 101, a test would simply take some data that you wanna analyze and output either a null hypothesis or alternative hypothesis. And so the data that, of the problem that we we're gonna study actually has pretty much the same dimensions as the data that we had in the original problem that we wanted. And we're gonna decide between two different hypotheses. The null hypothesis is gonna be simply, the data comes from a Gaussian matrix with IID entries, a standard IID entries. And the, sorry? No, sorry. And the alternative hypothesis is that there is a planted uh, vector within this matrix that's a vector of alls and uh, ones and minus ones. And so I, I cannot make it just the first vector. So I have, I'm gonna apply a rotation to the, vector, to the matrix that I have so that I cannot simply see the first column. Um, and so I wanna decide whether or not my matrix comes from this model or it comes from this model, okay? So a good test would give me good type one and type two errors. So if you, again, remember from, from statistics 101, Type one error is simply the probability of answering alternative whenever the data came from the null. Type two is a, the same thing, but with this guy's flip, the probability of saying null whenever the data came from the alternative. Okay. And so why are this, why is this problem believed to be hard? Well, the computer scientists have been obsessing about these ideas for, for 10 years now, and they understand a few problems fairly well. Uh, and they have some evidence for that. So this is one of those problems. And what they, they have been able to do is prove that for some big families of algorithms, you cannot get good tests. So you're always gonna have a bad type one plus type two error. So this is an example of that. So this is a, a family, a very powerful family of tests called a spectral tests, where maybe the details are not super important, but the idea is you take your data, you somehow construct a matrix with that data, and then you measure uh, if the norm of that matrix is smaller than some T or bigger than some T. And you assume that all the entries of your matrix are polynomial <laughs> and the size of the matrix that you construct is polynomial. Uh, and so that constrains the, the family of, of tests that you, you have, but it's actually very broad and people have used tests like this for all sorts of different tasks. So they believe that this is a very strong family of tests. Um, and two years ago, Mao and, and Wine actually proved that whenever you have, you're in this regime where n is much smaller than d squared, then any test coming from this family would actually give you bad type one plus type two error. And bad here just means that you cannot have uh, too fast of uh, a decrease that is too fast in the number of samples that you have. So it's uh, n to the power of some c where this c is fixed and universal. Where's P here? Uh, within that C. What if P is log N? That's a, a, a good question. There is a way to, to get something similar with log N. Okay. 
Uh, but that's slightly more complicated than what I wanted to put in this slide. Okay, so um, so now we, we know why this is hard. And now we, we need a reduction from the problem that we have to the problem, the problem that we just presented. And so we were able to prove such a reduction that says the following. Assume that you have an estimator for the clustering problem that achieves the error that we want. Then from that estimator, you could actually come up with a test using that estimator that would give you good type one plus type two error, where good here, DC is sort of related to how much separation you have. So you can make it as good as you want and you could actually break that uh, theorem that you had before. Okay. So intuitively what this is saying is that it seems unlikely there is a polynomial time algorithm for this family of problems, this family of algorithms. Questions? Dima, you seem to be puzzled. Okay. All right. Uh, so, and finally, I just wanted to give another piece of evidence with this semi-definite relaxation. So before we talk about this Gorman-Williamson idea, and the Gorman-Williamson idea is based on this very simple observation that actually, although we had a maximization of a quadratic form, we could rewrite that problem as a linear program, where instead of a quadratic form, what I get is that this H is acting on some Y that now is a matrix. And that Y lives in some convex set that is simply the convex set of the outer products of uh, the Y's that live in the, in the hypergrid. And since every LP achieves its maximum at the vertices, then this could actually give you a solution to the original problem you want, because you would find one of these guys as, as a vertice. Cool, so it's a linear program, but not all convex problems are easy. This is one of those examples. In fact, this guy has a name. Whenever you have a name, that means that you probably, you're probably important. Uh, so you can actually prove that optimizing over this set, the cut polytope is LMO that is also hard, right? Sorry? LMO is hard. Linear maximization oracle for this polytope is also hard. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what makes it hard, yeah. Um, so Gomez and Williamson had this idea. Actually, this dates a little bit, dates back to another, Sort of family of work, but these guys are the ones that got the credit for it. But they had this idea of relaxing this problem and changing a little bit the set that you have here. Now you're not going to have a cut polytope. You're not going to have a polytope at all. You can make this set a little bit fatter and solve that problem with the fatter problem with the difference that this set is actually nice to describe. This is an SDP representation of uh, of this set. Um, and intuitively what you are trying to do, again, this is very hand wavy, is try to match second order information about uh, this cut polytope. <coughs> so that you can generalize this idea. This was a, an idea of Pablo Parillo and Jean Lasser independently at the beginning of the 2000s. And instead of just taking second order information, you can take K order information. So you can have a hierarchy of different sets that are fatter than the, the guy that you want to approximate, but are closer and closer to the one you want. Um, and each one of them has a tractable representation. So the, the, the way to think about it is you have this set that is a polytope, but a very complicated polytope, but it is hard to uh, describe. And you can make it a little bit fatter and easier to represent. Each one of these guys, if you take any level, would give you uh, a tractable representation that you can use for an optimization problem. And the idea is it's each one of those grab higher moment information about that. Really the details are not important right now, but we have algorithms for each fixed level of a hierarchy, algorithms that will solve a problem like this in polynomial time. This idea that seems very simple actually has had a lot of applications in machine learning and dynamical systems, control theory, and uh, statistics. There are many problems that we only know how to solve using machinery like this. So maybe we can do something like that for our problem. It turns out that uh, we proved that that's actually not the case. Um, so we proved that whenever n is slightly smaller than e to the power of three over two, and you take this k being not so large, so it's some polynomial of this n, 
then with high probability there exists a solution of this problem that is uh, statistically independent to the true labels. So your algorithm might return something that has nothing to do with this. Cool. Um, so the intuition is that for any small degree here, uh, a solution is pretty much like a random guess. All right. Uh, so just to summarize the talk, we came up with this statistically optimal procedure that achieves the two things that we want, but is unfortunately not tractable from a computational perspective. We came up with an algorithm that is tractable and we have guarantees to give you quadratic sample complexity, but we don't know what to do in between. And we can give you some evidence that apparently there is no polynomial time algorithm that would solve the problem in, in the orange for gen. Uh, and this is pretty much the end of the talk, but before I end, I just wanted to do some shameless advertisement. Uh, as Dima said, I'm actually moving to, to Johns Hopkins and I'm looking for PhD students and looking for postdocs. So if you're interested in things like this, the intersection between uh, optimization and statistics, please shoot me an email. And that's all I have for today. Thank you very much.